Hello, this is Dr. Arman bringing you another exciting pre-lab video uh, for Genome Chemistry 1 Laboratories. In this video, we'll be discussing Experiment 5, Synthesis, or excuse me, uh, Stoichiometry, which involves two parts. We'll be doing a, a reaction involving a metal halide and sodium saccharinate and forming what's called a metal complex. And we'll be talking a little bit about metal complexes in the videos in the video, and then we'll be looking at determining the percent of phosphorus in fertilizer. And so we'll be looking at both of those experiments, which are in experiment five. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. So with experiment five, by the way, we're almost, we're already halfway, a little over halfway through the semester. And so we're on the downward slope. And so experiment five consists of two parts, Synthesis of a metal complex, in particular a transition metal complex, and gravimetric analysis of phosphorus. And even in the gravimetric analysis of phosphorus, we form a metal complex as well. So first we're going to talk a little bit about the synthesis of transmetal complex, or excuse me, transition metal complexes, a little background into them and also a little bit of explaining how we're gonna make this metal complex involving uh, saccharinate and a transition metal. So what is a transition metal complex? To give you a very basic uh, definition of this, and if you take inorganic chemistry later on, uh, you'll get a more detailed explanation. So I'm gonna do the very basic fundamental uh, explanation of it. And so a transition metal complex obviously has a transition metal and it's coordinated uh, or you could say bonded to, but it's more of a coordination because it's not a physical covalent bond, it's an attraction to one or more ligands. And so you need a transition metal and you need a ligand. And ligands can be of two forms. They can either be neutral such as in the picture shown below with ammonia, or they can be anionic as well. And these are bound or bonded. I wouldn't use the word bonded. I would use it very loosely, but bound to the metal, transition metal. And so what happens is if we look at ammonia, for example, if we draw the Lewis structure of ammonia, Ammonia has this, what we call an accessible pair of electrons. So ammonia has this accessible pair of electrons. Cobalt is a cation, which is electron deficient. It's hungry for electrons. So what happens is these electrons claw onto the cobalt because cobalt is hungry for electrons. Nitrogen has this accessible pair of electrons and so it claws on to the metal and we form this attraction between the metal and the ligand <coughs> and since there's only one lone pair of electrons on this particular compound we call it a monodentate uh, ligand mono meaning one dentate meaning claw so it has one pair of electrons that can claw itself onto the cation now with transition metals, the number of ligands that can surround uh, a transition metal can vary. But for the purposes of this lab, uh, we're going to assume that the transition, the number of ligands surrounding the transition metal is six. So whenever you see a transition metal, at least for this lab, when you're doing questions, uh, the number of ligands that should surround it is six. And uh, with six ligands, you get what's called octahedral geometry. Of the complex. 
Now, when you take inorganic chemistry, this does vary and you'll learn all the intricacies of that But for at least for Gene Chem 1, we're just going to assume that this metal only uh, can have, has six ligands around it, whether they're all the same or different, uh, that depends on the charge of the ligand and, or the charge of the ion and what ligand uh, you're using. So this is octahedral geometry when we have uh, six ligands around it. Now this chloride on the, the side here, this is not a ligand because it's not coordinated uh, to the cobalt, but it's there to balance the charge. So we have a plus three from the cobalt. We have a negative total of negative three from the chloride, the charge is balanced. But for the purposes of this lab, we're just going to assume that every metal ion that we encounter has six ligands around it. And so ammonia is a monodentate ligand because it only has one accessible pair of electrons on the, the molecule to claw itself onto the metal ion. Now, what, what accounts for accessible pairs of electrons? The two most common are uh, three, core, uh, three coordinate or three, three bonded nitrogen atom because it has that lone pair on the nitrogen. So like ammonia or its derivatives. Single bonded oxygen atoms have an accessible pair of electrons as well. Those are the two most common uh, types. Now, besides monodentate, <clears throat> we also have a bidentate ligand. And again, when we're determining whether it's mono, bi, or even tridentate, we're looking at the number of claws on a particular molecule. So for a bidentate ligand, there are two nitrogen atoms on the same molecule that coordinate to this platinum ion. Likewise, on this oxalate ion, there are two oxygen atoms on the same uh, ion or yeah, polyatomic ion, which makes it bidentate. So that's what we mean by mono, bi, and tridentate, the number of claws on a particular molecule. So like for this tridentate ligand here, we have three nitrogen atoms that can claw onto the iron. And so this would be a tridentate ligand, whereas the chlorides here are monodentate because they only claw on one position. So again, the number of claws will dictate if a molecule is bi, tri, mono, tetra, et cetera. And when we have what's called chelating ligands, these are called polydentate ligands because they have multiple uh, claws on the ligand. And here, for example, we have a ligand that has six claws on it. And this is the what's referred to as ethyldiamine tetraacetate or commonly referred to as EDTA. And it kind of wraps itself around the uh, metal ion. So again, whether something is mono, bi, or tridentate, et cetera, depends on the number of claws on a particular molecule. And that's very important to remember. So the first part of the experiment five, dealing with the synthesis of a transition metal complex, we're going to be using the saccharinate ligand so the saccharinate ligand is just a deprotonated version of saccharin. And the saccharinate ligand, aka saccharin, is a carcinogen. So it means it causes cancer. So we want to be careful when we're using it. And so the saccharin salt or the saccharinate salt that we're going to be using in this uh, reaction is sodium saccharinate, which is shown here. And it's a dihydrate. And we talked about, or dihydrate means there's two water molecules loosely bound 
to the sodium. Then we, we're going to mix it with our metal halide and we're going to produce a transition metal complex. Now the number of saccharinate is dependent on the charge of the metal ion. So for example, if you have copper two plus, well, you're gonna need two saccharinates to balance the charge because here you'll see that in nitrogen has the negative one charge, sodium is the positive charge. If you were working with iron three plus, then you would have three saccharinates around the iron. And then the rest of the positions around the metal will be made up with water. Because remember, we said that each transition metal cation wants six uh, ligands around it. So if we have, for example, copper two plus and it has two saccharinates, that means it's going to have four water molecules. And so it's very important to get this equation right because if you don't, then it's gonna throw off your calculations to determine which one is the limiting uh, reactant. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip gears here and go to my, go to the e-notebook and show you how you can draw your structures in the e-notebook. So now I've come to the uh, lab notebook. I'm gonna show you how to draw uh, this reaction. And so what you wanna do in your e-notebook is, you want to uh, insert a widget. And the widget you want to insert is chemical sketcher. So now we have the chemical sketcher. We can sketch out our reaction. So in this reaction, I'm going to use uh, nickel two chloride. So here we start with the A. I'm going to do NiCl2. Plus, and we're going to draw the saccharinate, the sodium saccharinate dihydrate. So to draw the sodium saccharinate dihydrate, you need to use the benzene ring. Oops, and just double click once. Then we're gonna use this five membered ring, bring it to where it's right there. You see how I drag it, drop it there. Now we have that. Start adding atoms. So we click on nitrogen, put a nitrogen there. Now we add some double bonds. So here we have a double bond there, which is an oxygen. And down here we have a sulfur. With two double bonded oxygens off of it. So we put the double bonds first and then we add the oxygen. So now this is not a, this is just a nitrogen here. So if we get, do something like this. Select sodium. Ah, that doesn't look good. Let's undo. Here we just do nitrogen. So what I did is I, let me undo this so I can show you again. I added a single bond, then I changed it to a dash. And then I went to my periodic table, select sodium, 
and replace the CH3 with the sodium. So this shows us kind of a coordination between the nitrogen and the sodium. And then it's dot with two H2O. Let me see if there's a dot here. No, nope, it's all right. So those are my reactants. We do a yield. And so remember that the <clears throat> charge of the, uh, what's it called? Charge of the transition metal cation will dictate the number of uh, saccharinates that you use. So here nickel is a two plus. So we're gonna put nickel in the center and put two saccharinates around it. So what I can do is if I use this selection tool, I can select just the saccharinate, copy it and paste it here. And I'm gonna paste another one as well because I need two of them. And I can rotate it towards facing this direction. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a nickel in the center here. And connect it to the two saccharinates. Now remember, we need to use a dash bond. So I'm going to click on the dash like this. And then remember the other four positions will be water molecules because remember the happy number is uh, six. So let me draw some H2Os here. And so you wanna draw the H2O such that the oxygen is pointing toward the nickel. Go ahead, put four bonds, and then we'll replace them, rename them H2O. So let's select oxygen. And add another hydrogen. Oops, can't do that. All right, so now what I do is I click on it and you have to write it such that the oxygen is pointing towards the nickel. So I'm gonna do OH2 and see how it has the oxygen coordinating to the nickel. Here, I'm gonna do OH2 and here OH2. So that's our a uh, saccharinate complex involving nickel and the other product is sodium chloride. So now we need to balance this equation. So we have two saccharinates and four waters. So we need to put a two in front of here.
So there's two of these. So now we have two saccharinates in, in four waters and we need to put a two in front of NaCl. Oops, let me undo that. Two in a CL. Well, it's being difficult. There we go. We rewrite it as plus 2NaCl. And so that's how you draw your uh, reaction. So whichever metal halide you're given, you need to determine the uh, charge of the metal halide. That'll tell you the number of uh, saccharinate ions uh, to uh, put around the metal ion to balance the charge. And then you can calculate your limiting reagent as well. So in this experiment, you're gonna be using one gram of the sodium saccharinate And your TA is going to assign you a certain mass of the metal halide. And so from that, you can do your calculations to determine which reactant is the limiting reactant. So now moving on to the second part of the, of the lab here, where we're doing the gravimetric analysis of phosphorus and fertilizer. So we're going to give you a little bit of background in fertilizer and then show you some of the calculations involving this particular part of the lab. Now for this part of the lab and also the last part of the lab, make sure you share results with your group, other, other members in the lab because they're gonna be given two different fertilizers. And so those who have fertilizer A will share results. Those with fertilizer B will share results. And you're gonna to need to include this in your lab report. So just to start off with, with all fertilizers, there are three primary nutrients. Uh, the first one is nitrogen and nitrogen causes, you know, rapid growth. So if you see a high nitrogen content in the fertilizer, it's going to cause a rapid growth in the plant. Of phosphorus, you find high amounts of phosphorus in those fertilizers that promote blooming because phosphorus is needed for plants to bloom. And then the third primary nutrient is potassium, which helps reduce uh, disease in plants. So all three of these are the primary nutrients found in all fertilizers. So any fertilizer you find is going to have these three uh, primary nutrients in it. Now, after these three nutrients, you may have secondary nutrients as well, but these are the three primary nutrients found in fertilizers. And so the way we express how much of these three nutrients are in each fertilizer is we look at the NPK uh, ratio. And so the NPK ratio tells us the percent of nitrogen, the percent of phosphorus, and the percent of potassium in that particular fertilizer. And so with nitrogen, there are many different types depending on what type of fer fertilizer you get. There is ammonia-based nitrogen, which is very fast acting, water soluble. Nitrates are another type of nitrogen, again, a very water soluble uh, nitrogen. Urea, an organic-based, nitrogen shown here and then water insoluble nitrogen which is you know uh what's it called animal uh, 
manure. And that's another type of nitrogen source. So you see with nitrogen, we get many different sources that it can come from, depending on what type of fertilizer uh, you have. Now with the type of phosphorus, usually it's reported as phosphorus oxide. More notably, it's actually reported as diphosphorus uh, pentaoxide. Uh, for K, usually it's referred to as potash, which is a variety of potassium salts, such as potassium nitrate, uh, potassium sulfate, and it's usually reported as K2O. And so here in this example of a, a fertilizer label, this 5-3-3 is the NPK ratio. And so in the label, it tells you the total nitrogen is 5%. And this is a breakdown of what that 5% is. So it's different sources of uh, nitrogen. Next is the available phosphate, 3% is reported as P2O5, and then the potash is reported as potassium oxide. And then we have some secondary nutrients such as calcium, magnesium, and even sulfur, and then some other components as well for the insoluble uh, nitrogen component. So all fertilizer labels have this information. And so in lab, when you're working with your fertilizer, your TA will have the NPK ratio for whatever fertilizer you're using. So we told you that the NPK ratio tells you the reported amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium in a fertilizer. But for example, how could we find the actual percent P in the fertilizer sample? And so we know the NPK ratio, 19, 6, 12. We know that percent P is reported as P2O5. And the actual percent P, we need to assume 100 grams. Because if we assume 100 grams, we can get the mass of P2O5 in that sample. And then what we do is we convert the mass of P2O5 to mass of phosphorus. So to convert the mass of P2O5, we got to first convert it to moles of P2O5. So mass divided by molar mass gives us moles. Again, we're going to do this to find the actual percent P in the fertilizer. And percent P is reported as P2O5. So we assume 100 grams. So we know that there's six grams of P2O5 in our 100 gram sample. We can convert that to moles. And it's a two to one mole ratio. So two moles of phosphorus for every one mole of P2O5. And then we multiply by the molar mass of phosphorus, we get uh, 2.62 grams. And since it's out of 100 grams, it's 2.62% of actual uh, phosphorus. This is how you go from the reported P to the actual P. You assume 100 gram sample, convert your mass of P2O5 to moles of P2O5, use the mole ratio of two to one, get the moles of P, and then you can get the mass of phosphorus. So in dealing with the analysis of phosphorus and fertilizer, we're actually looking at a type of analysis in chemistry that we haven't uh, encountered so far. So over the last few labs, we've been doing some qualitative analysis. So doing reactions, recording observations, does it react? Yes, what are my observations? We've also looked at a little bit of quantitative analysis so mixing amounts of substances in solution. We've done volumetric analysis when we're doing the titration. So we've done that several times. With this part of the lab, we're doing gravimetric analysis. And here we're trying to get a product isolated 
and in a wayable form. And so as you'll see here, there are many steps and this is a very time consuming uh, process. So you gotta make sure you do each step right so you get the right mass of product at the end. And so in this lab, you're gonna be measuring out a certain amount of fertilizer. You're gonna dissolve it in water, add magnesium sulfate, heptahydrate, add some ammonia, and you're going to form a product that is called magnesium ammonium phosphate hexahydrate. And from this, we're going to determine the percents of P, which is the actual phosphorus in the sample, and the percent of P2O5, which is the reported phosphorus in the sample uh, of our fertilizer sample. And it's the percent of P2O5 that should be very similar to the, uh, the phosphorus percent in the NPK ratio. So the first thing we want to do is we want to determine the moles of our product, magnesium ammonium phosphate hexahydrate. And again, mass divided by molar mass, we get the moles of our product. Now that we know the moles of our product, if we look at the chemical reaction, we see that one formula unit of our product contains one phosphorus. So there's a one-to-one -one mole ratio between phosphorus and our product. So if we know the moles of our product, we know the moles of our uh, phosphorus. So now we know the moles of phosphorus, we can find the mass of phosphorus, 1.29 grams of phosphorus. And all of this phosphorus came from the 10 gram sample. So now we can find the actual percent phosphorus in this fertilizer sample. So we just take our mass of phosphorus divided by the mass of the fertilizer sample and we get the percent, 12.9%. Now we need to determine the mass of P2O5. So using the moles of phosphorus, we can find the moles of P2O5 and then the mass of P2O5. So to do the moles of P2O5, we want to use the mole ratio. So two moles of phosphorus, for every one mole of P2O5, we get the moles of P2O5. Now we can find the mass of P2O5. And your mass of P2O5 should always be greater than the mass of phosphorus. Now that we know the mass, we're going to divide it by the mass of fertilizer uh, that we started with. And we get the percent of P2O5. And it's this percent that should be similar to what's on the NPK ratio. So just a few key things. Uh, you'll be using two grams of fertilizer your TA will assign you either fertilizer A or B. When you're uh, dissolving the fertilizer in water, some of the fertilizer uh, may not dissolve because there's some water insoluble components. So after about 10 to 15 minutes of trying to dissolve it, you're gonna filter off the precipitate and get the filtrate. And it's the filtrate what's in the flask that you're going to use in the next step of the experiment. The precipitate you can discard when you're dissolving your fertilizer. Also, when you're ready to filter your product, make sure you pre-weigh your filter paper uh, before you put it into the fil filtration or the Buchner funnel because you're gonna to need to subtract the mass of the filter paper from the mass of product and filter paper after drying. 
And so when you filter it the second time, after you've added the two molar NH3, uh, two molar ammonia solution, you're going to keep the precipitate and discard the filtrate. And it's that precipitate after you've added that ammonia solution that's going to be the magnesium ammonium phosphate hexahydrate. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some walk you through, I guess, the different parts of the lab. So here we're going to weigh out our mass of metal halide uh, that our TA assigned to us. So in this example, the, the TA is weighing out uh, some mass of copper to chloride. And we're actually going to weigh out about 0.4 grams of copper to chloride. So if you overweigh, you overshoot the mass, get another weighing boat and take some out of your current weighing boat and put it into the other. Because you don't want to add this stuff back to the uh, jar that you got it out of because it could contaminate the uh, rest of the material. So here the TA got the mass of copper 2 chloride, 0.39 grams. So now we're going to weigh out our one gram of sodium saccharinate. So we have 0.39 grams of the copper two chloride, and we're going to weigh out one gram or close, oh, it should be one gram of the sodium saccharinate or close to it. So here you see that we weighed out 0.99 grams. I mean, close to it is good enough, but just make sure you record whatever mass you weighed out. So now what we're going to do is we're going to dissolve our copper two chloride and sodium saccharinate into two different 50 mil beakers. And we're going to use about uh, 15 milliliters of DI water. So make sure you measure out. It's, you know, it's an approximation. Not to be exactly 15, but around 15 milliliters of DI water for each the copper two chloride and the sodium saccharinate. You'll see how the TA kind of gently washes the weighing boat to get any of the uh, leftover copper two chloride that wasn't in that didn't go into solution. And we do the same thing with the sodium saccharinate as well. And notice the color change as she stirred it, it went from green uh, to blue. So you want to make sure your copper two chloride is dissolved.
Now we're going to do the same thing with sodium saccharinate. Again, 15 milliliters of DI water to dissolve all the sodium saccharinate. And remember, most, you know, this should be very fairly easy to dissolve because it's a sodium salt. So once you've dissolved all the sodium saccharinate, you're gonna now mix the two solutions together. Now we pour the copper two chloride solution into the sodium saccharinate solution. And then we're going to place this solution on a hot plate and heat it. So we're gonna take about five milliliters of DI water and kind of wash the beaker that contained the copper two chloride solution so that we can get out any residual of that solution that didn't go into the beaker. So you just put a little bit, the five mils of DI water in the beaker, kind of swirl it around that contain the copper two chloride. And then we're gonna pour it into our beaker containing copper two chloride and sodium saccharinate. Now we placed it on the hot plate, you know, set the hot plate to around 290. You'll have a stir bar in there as well. And we're gonna let it heat until we start to see a little blue crust on the edges of the beaker. So I go back. So here we wanna, you know, set the hot plate to roughly around 290. This is a good temperature to heat the solution. You're gonna have a stir bar as well in the beaker. So make sure that's moving as well. So now we're going to heat this solution on the hot plate until we start to see a little bit of a blue crusting above the water level. And so while this is heating, you can go start on the next part of the lab, which involves the fertilizer. So with the fertilizer part of the lab, your TA will assign to you fertilizer A or B, and you'll need to weigh out two grams of that fertilizer. And I'll record that down as well. So mass of fertilizer. Two point oh five grams. After leaving it on the balance for a little bit, we see that it got back down to two point oh one. So let me correct that in our mass. So we have two point oh one grams of fertilizer. So next, we're going to dissolve the fertilizer. So we're going to use a two hundred and fifty mil beaker. We're going to put our fertilizer into the beaker. So here we're going to try to dissolve as much of the fertilizer as we can. So we're going to use about uh, 20 milliliters of DI water. So we used a 50 milliliter graduated cylinder. We measured out 
uh, 20 milliliters of DI water. And we're gonna add this uh, to the fertilizer to dissolve it. And again, when you're dissolving it, I mean, about 10, uh, 15 minutes of trying to dissolve it because not all of the uh, fertilizer will dissolve. Some of it will still remain out of solution. So again, we added about 20 milliliters of DI water. We're gonna be stirring it, trying to dissolve the fertilizer. So after about uh, 10 minutes or so, we, we're going to now filter off the insoluble part and collect the filtrate. So again, the vacuum filtration should already be set up. You gently turn on the vacuum. You don't need much vacuum. You wanna put your filter paper in and kind of wet it with DI water so that it, the vacuum pulls it uh, to the uh, flask. You must make sure you wet it first or else when you pour it, the precipitate will go under the uh, filter paper. So wet it with DI water. And you'll know that the flask is working because you'll see the water drip through while the vacuum is being applied. And so when we filter this, we're going to keep what's in the flask and discard what's in the paper. We pour our fertilizer solution in, and it doesn't take long, uh, just a few seconds. We're going to wash the beaker with some DI water to get any of the residual fertilizer uh, that we missed. It doesn't hurt to wash the, the beaker so that you know, it helps minimize the loss of fertilizer. Two or three washings is good. And so what's in the flask, we want to keep. What's in the filter paper, we can discard. So even we wash the filter paper with a little water as well to wash off any residual uh, fertilizer that's soluble from the precipitate. You know, cleaning or washing is one of the most important parts of this lab because you want to make sure you get pure product. So once you think that all the uh, solution has gone through the flask, we're going to now pour this into a beaker and add our other reagents. So again, what's in the Buchner funnel, you don't need to keep on the first filtration. Now, when you're pouring this into the beaker, make sure that the nipple that the hose was on is pointing up so that when you pour it out, it doesn't go through that, that glass nipple. So make sure you hold it such that it's pointing up and you don't cause any uh, spillage. So look how the glass nipple is pointing up while we're pouring the solution into the beaker. This way it doesn't spill through that area. So now we're ready to add our reagents. The two reagents are mag magnesium sulfate heptahydrate and two molar ammonia. So you can even put a little DI water in the flask and wash out any of the residual fertilizer solution. Always good to wash. Just needs a little water when you're washing. So now first we're going to add 36 milliliters of magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. So again, that's 36. Thirty-six milliliters of MgSO4. Thirty-six 
that's added first. So that's what we're doing first uh, here. And when you add the magnesium sulfate heptahydrate, you're not going to see any change in the solution. And next, we're going to add 15 milliliters of two molar ammonia. So the next thing we do is we, we pour in the 15 milliliters, two molar NH3. So first is the 36 milliliters of magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. And then we pour the 15 milliliters of two molar ammonia. And when you add the ammonia solution, this is where you should see the precipitate form. And kind of mix it around, and you'll see a white precipitate form in the beaker. It should look like this. So the next step is to place this on an ice bath for about 15 or about 20 minutes for it to cool down and all the product to precipitate out. So you'll go to the, the ice machine, get some ice in one of the bowls, put your beaker in it and kind of put ice around the bowl so that your beaker will cool down. And so it should look something like uh, this. You can also add a little water uh, to the bowl as well to kind of help uh, cool it down good. And we're going to let this sit for about 20 minutes or so so that all the product will precipitate out. So you can add a little water. You don't have to use DI water. You can use tap water because ice and water gets a little bit colder than just ice by itself. And so if you add a little water to it, it'll help uh, cool down the beaker. And so again, 50, about 20 minutes, uh, leave this to cool down. So, <coughs> excuse me. So while that is cooling down, now we're going to go back to the hot plate with our uh, copper saccharinate solution. And by now it's probably time to take it off the heat. You see some blue crusting along the edges. And so we're gonna take this and add it to a uh, ice bath as well. So we have to cool it down so that the product will precipitate out our copper to uh, saccharinate. And it's kind of hard to see, but again, there was some crusting on the uh, beaker, and we're going to place this in an ice bath uh, as well for it to cool down and let all the precipitate come out of solution. And again, around 20 minutes or so is how long you should leave it in. As a longer is a little bit better if you have some time. That way you get everything to precipitate out. So now we go back to our fertilizer. You see that all the product has precipitated out and settle at the bottom of the beaker. And so now it's time for us to filter out the product. So first you wanna pre-weigh the filter paper and record the mass of that. So the mass of the filter paper is 0 0.18 grams. We place the filter paper in the Buchner funnel. 
again, add a little bit of DI water so that when you turn on the vacuum, it'll pull the filter paper to the bottom. And you can see if it's dripping water into the flask, that means the vacuum is working. So now we're getting ready to pour our solution containing the fertilizer precipitate, the magnesium ammonium phosphate hexahydrate. And this time we wanna save what's in the funnel and discard what's in the flask. And so in the manual, it says we're going to wash with five milliliter portions of isopropyl alcohol. So it's best to, when you do that, uh, first pour the five milliliter portion into the flask, swirl it around, or excuse me, into the beaker, swirl it around to get any residual uh, precipitate. So you measure out five milliliters of isopropyl alcohol, pour it into the beaker, swirl it around, pour that into the uh, flask or into the filter. So you're kind of getting the leftover product in the beaker by adding the isopropyl alcohol and then pouring it into the funnel to also wash the product as well. And you want to do this, you know, two or three times washing it with isopropyl alcohol. The more you wash it, uh, the better, the more pure your product will be. And so you leave it on the vacuum until you're sure that you've gotten, you've, you've removed all the water as much as you can from the samples. So you'll notice in the filter or in the funnel, just a very small drip will occur. That means you've pretty much removed all the water from the sample. So again, she's washing with the second uh, five milliliter portion of isopropyl alcohol into the beaker to remove any of the product that hasn't yet come out. So now after washing it with isopropyl alcohol two or three times, the product in the funnel, and the way you know that it's almost done is because it's a very slow drip left. So this means that most of the water has been removed or most of the water slash isopropyl alcohol has been removed uh, from the uh, product. So now what you do is you take the filter paper off, put it on a watch glass and place it in the oven. So here we're scraping out the product from the funnel and make sure that you don't spill as much as the TA did here because you're going to lose some of that mass of product and that might be associated with our error that we have. And also put the filter paper on the watch glass as well because there still be some product on the filter paper. So get as much as you can, place it on the watch glass and then we're going to place it in the oven for about, you know, 20 to 30 minutes until the product is dry. And so now it's ready to be placed in the oven. Again, 20 to 30 minutes until the product is dry. So we're gonna go place this in the oven and now we're gonna go and filter our product from the first part of the lab, the copper saccharinate uh, part of the lab.
So one important thing is, is when you're discarding the waste, you know, what we collected in the flask, since this is the fertilizer part of the lab, it goes into a specific uh, waste container. It's the aqueous waste for the fertilizer part of the lab. And it'll actually say on the flask, you know, the reactants that we used with the fertilizer. Go back and so you can see that. So each part of the lab has its own waste containers. So see here it says magnesium sulfate heptahydrate, ammonia, isopropyl alcohol, plant food. So your filtrate from the fertilizer goes into this waste beaker. So now we're ready to filter off our copper saccharinate product. We're gonna need cold deionized water. So make sure you have a bottle of deionized water sitting in the in an ice bath as long with your copper uh, saccharinate. And we're going to pre-weigh uh, the filter paper. So here the filter paper is 0.18 gram. We're going to place this into the funnel. Now, between using the funnel uh, for the fertilizer part of the lab and the copper saccharinate part of the lab, you need to rinse the funnel out with a DI water. So again, once you rinse it, you put your filter paper in, make sure you wet the filter paper, turn on the vacuum, and the filter paper will stick to the bottom of the funnel. So now we're going to add our copper saccharinate uh, precipitate slash solution into the funnel. And again, we're going to keep what's on in the funnel and discard what's in the uh, flask. So again, we're going to wash this with cold water and it needs to be cold. That's why we sit it on an ice bath. And one thing to note is in the flask, if you notice that it is a slight tint of blue, that will tell you that not all the copper, for example, you're using copper two chloride, not all the copper ions precipitated out. So what should happen is your flask should be colorless, which indicates that all the copper ions precipitated out, which would tell you that uh, copper two chloride is the limiting react it because if copper was in excess, your solution will still be uh, blue. So that's one thing to look out for. Is my solution in the flask uh, still blue? That will confirm, if it's not blue, will confirm that copper two chloride should be the limiting reactant because all the copper ions precipitated out. And even wash the beaker with the cold DI water. Make sure you take the stir bar out and kind of wash it as well. You don't want that mass uh, with the filter paper and the product. So here, just to zoom in, you see that this is a nice blue precipitate. And you see that the solution in the flask is colorless. So that indicates to us that all the copper ions precipitated out. So we do have these magnetic bars that you can use, magnetic sticks that you can use to get the stir bars out. And then you can wash it into the beaker with cold DI water. And then pour that into the funnel.
And once you do this, again, let the vacuum run for a little while until you see all the water has been removed as much as it can from the uh, product. And also wash the products like this as well when you're uh, filtering. So here, what we're gonna do is once you think that all the water has been removed from the pre precipitate as much as it can, we're gonna take this, put it on a watch glass, uh, just like we did with the fertilizer product, make sure the filter paper is on the watch glass as well. We're gonna dry it in the oven, 15, 20 minutes, as much as it takes to dry the product. And then we're gonna weigh the product and filter paper. So here, this is the product on the watch class with the filter paper. So now we're gonna take this and place it in the oven and then discard what's in the uh, Erlenmeyer flask, sidearm flask. So for the uh, waste involving the copper or the saccharinate part of the lab, it has its own particular uh, waste container. It'll say sodium saccharinate on the container, uh, the chloride, the metal halides we're using, and water as well. So each part of its of the lab has its own separate aqueous and solid waste container. So again, make sure you put the waste container or the waste in the correct uh, container. Make sure that the glass nipple is pointing up when you pour so that it doesn't spill out. That's how you discard of the waste. So now we're getting ready to record the mass of our products. So the, the products have dried. We've let them cool to room temperature. We're going to record the mass of each product. Again, you need to zero out a weighing boat. This is the fertilizer. So look that the filter paper goes in as well. And the product is really dry it slides right off the filter paper or the, the watch glass, excuse me. And so notice how dry, it's not clumpy, it's very fine product. And the mass of the filter paper and product is 2.24 grams. So now we can discard of this waste in the solid waste container. So again, make sure you place it into the uh, beaker for the fertilizer solid waste. So it looks something like this. You're gonna pour your solid waste into the solid waste container. Do not pour your solid waste into the aqueous uh, waste container. And don't uh, discard the filter paper in there. Only the product goes in the beaker. So make sure you take the filter paper out and throw it in the trash and then add the product to the container. So the filter paper goes in the trash. The product goes into the waste container. You take it out. And then you pour your product into the waste container. And again, there's one for each part of experiment five. So now we're ready to uh, weigh the product of the copper two saccharinate. Uh, we've taken it out of the oven, it's dry. We 
we're going to weigh the amount of this product. You gotta make sure that your sample's dry uh, before you weigh it and it's at room temperature. So the mass of filter paper and product is 0 0.90 grams. So now we've recorded the, what, the mass of this, we can discard it into the proper solid waste container. So for the copper saccharinate solid product, it goes into the beaker. That's for the solid waste of the saccharinate part of the lab. And again, make sure you take the filter paper out first before pouring the product into the beaker. So the filter paper goes in the trash can, the product goes into this waste beaker. So get all the product off the filter paper and then discard the filter paper into the trash, pour your product into the waste container. And so now we've seen the kind of walkthrough of the lab. Now let's work on the calculations. So I'm gonna start with the fertilizer calculations first. So we wanna determine the actual percent P and the reported percent P, we have the mass of fertilizer, mass of filter paper, mass of filter paper and product. So the first thing we can calculate is mass of product, which is 2.24 minus 0.18. Two point zero six. So that's the mass of product. Now we're going to convert the mass of product to moles of product. Two point zero six divided by two forty five point four. And we get 0 0.008394. So that's the moles of product. Remember the moles of product equal to moles of phosphorus. So now we can find the mass of phosphorus. And we get 0 0.2602. So that's the mass of phosphorus. Now we can find the percent actual percent P will be the mass of phosphorus divided by the mass of sample times 100. And we get about 12.9%. So that's the actual percent P, 12.9%. To find the reported percent P, we need to find the moles of P2O5. 
which is equal to the moles of phosphorus times one mole of P2O5 divided by two moles of P. And we get zero point zero zero four one nine seven. So now we have the moles of P2O5. We can find the mass of P2O5. So mass of P2O5 is the moles times its molar mass, 141.9. And we get 0 0.5. Nine five six grams, and then to find the percent uh, reported P, which is the percent P two O five, it's just our mass divided by the mass of fertilizer times one hundred. and we get 29.6%. And then you would check this with the NPK ratio, this one at the bottom, the, the reported percent P should be similar to what your percent is for the NPK ratio of your fertilizer. And so that's how you do the calculations for the fertilizer part of the lab. Now for the copper saccharinate part of the lab, first we need to write our chemical equation. So it'd be CuCl2 plus uh, NaSAC dot 2H2O yields uh, CuCAC2 dot 4H2O plus NaCl. And so to balance this equation, you need to put a two here and a two here. So first we're going to use copper chloride or copper two chloride and see what the moles of product are for that. And we'll do the same for sodium saccharate. So we're going to take the mass of copper two chloride divided by its molar mass and then multiply it to one to one mole ratio. Hold on a second, I can't see. You change the font type. It's a one to one mole ratio. This will give us.
zero point zero zero two nine moles. So that's the moles of product from copper two chloride. And we're going to do the same with sodium saccharinate. divided by its molar mass. Times the mole ratio here, it's two to one, so one mole of copper, of our copper saccharinate, to two moles of the sodium saccharinate. And we get 0 0.00226. So here the sodium saccharinate based on these calculations is the limiting reactant. However, this is kind of uh, based on our observations, we saw that there was no blue left in the solution when we were filtering it, but maybe we missed, it was probably a light blue maybe. And so you see the moles are very close, but sodium saccharinate has a fewer number of moles. So now we're gonna calculate the theoretical yield. So it'd be 0 0.00226 times So the molar mass of that copper saccharinate is 527.86. So we get a theoretical yield of 1.19 grams. So this is the theoretical yield of our copper saccharinate. So now we can find the percent yield because we know the actual yield is 0.9 minus 0.18, grams. Excuse me, 72 grams, my bad. So now we have the actual yield, we can find the percent yield. And 
and we have about a 60.5% yield. Not bad, I mean, considering we did this reaction only once. And so that's how you do the calculations uh, for your saccharinate part of lab. So I hope this lecture, this session was informative and that you were able to understand some of the background to this lab, kind of a walkthrough of the procedure and also how to perform the calculations involved in this lab. If you like the video, click the like button. It's always nice to see that people like your content. And on that note, this is Dr. Armand signing off until next time.